Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see you this morning. And uh, I know looking around, it's good to see each other, even though numbers have gone down these past two years, and there are a lot of reasons. But I think one reason was people were just looking for an excuse not to come. And for some of us, it's hard to believe because we can't imagine being anywhere else. But not everyone shares that same thought. For some, church is a lot like school. And some people don't like school either. Now me, I wasn't a good student because I wasn't a good test taker. Church became another place where I had to learn. And we do want to learn, but sometimes I think we think we want to learn the rules, right? Learn the rules about heaven, which kind of feels like the ultimate test, right? The ultimate final. And we want to make sure that we're getting into heaven. And so we keep coming back to church each week to listen to the teacher. And then we kind of check off boxes and we say, well, I've done that. I've done that. Am I doing that? Am I obeying that? And to be fair, there are a lot of rules in the Bible. Rules in the Old Testament. And when you read the New Testament, it seems like Paul makes some rules. There's, there's a lot of rules. But is that how it's supposed to be? Is church just supposed to be school? Is it supposed to be a place where we learn the rules? Or is it supposed to be about something else? Shouldn't it be about following Jesus? When you read the stories of Jesus, does he strike you as a, as a rule follower? <laughs> or does he strike you as a rebel? Would Jesus want us in a school environment, learning and worrying about how we behave every week? Do you think he wants us to be worried about following the rules? Does Jesus come across as a, a suit and tie kind of guy? Or is he more jeans and flip-flops? Do you think Jesus worried what other people thought of him? Or did he march to the beat of his own drum? Was Jesus worried about making religious leaders happy? Or was he concerned about something else? I mean, forget what the church expects of you for just a moment. What does Jesus expect of you? And don't worry if you're making us happy. Don't worry if you're making me happy. What does Jesus want you to do? And today we're continuing our study in Matthew. Last week we were in Matthew 4 and we looked at Jesus' temptation in the desert. Today we're still in Matthew 4. And, and don't worry, we won't go this slow through the rest of the book. But I think at the end of chapter 4, uh, where Jesus calls his first disciples, there's some important things for us to note. Matthew 4, verse 18 says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Jesus calls his first disciples and he says two very simple words, follow me, follow me. And then these men do it, right? They leave, the Bible says, immediately and, and they follow. Why? This Jesus person must have been pretty special. He was. Who is Jesus? Who is the me in follow me? Well, I think typical responses to that question today, who is Jesus, would be, uh, Jesus was a great man. Jesus was a wonderful moral model. Jesus was an enlightened religious teacher. Jesus was an esteemed prophet. In 1983, there was a Gallup poll. They asked Americans, who do you think Jesus is? 27% felt Jesus was only human, but he had a special purpose. 
70% of those interviewed said Jesus was probably more than human. And only 42% said Jesus was God. And this is in a country where 81% of America say they're Christians. Who is Jesus? And why should we follow him? Apparently, even Christians don't know. (laughs) Jesus was the greatest historical figure and held by many to be the most important inspirational leader the world has ever known. But was he more than that? What do you think about Jesus? Who was he? This is a very important question. Probably the most important question that you or anyone else will ever answer. And it's primarily important because it's so inescapable. No one can avoid this. For you, you will either answer it in this world or the next. And since Christmas, we've been discovering who Jesus is, the little baby born in Bethlehem, and we learned that he was the son of David. He was prophesied from the Old Testament. He was a savior. He was the Messiah. The entire Bible points to his arrival and his life. The wise men brought him gifts, and they acknowledged that he was a king. He grows up into a man, and his cousin at his baptism says that he is the sacrificial lamb that takes away sins. The book of John begins that he is the light of the world. Last week, when we studied Jesus' temptation, we said that Jesus was the new Adam. He was the perfect Israelite. He was fully human. He was fully God. Who is Jesus? I would add that without Jesus, there is no reason to own or even read a Bible. Without Jesus, there is no forgiveness. Without Jesus, there is no hope of salvation. Without Jesus, there is no restoration of our relationship with God. Without Jesus, there can be no heaven, which means hell is our only option. Colossians 1 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross." The book of Colossians was written to counter wrong answers to the question, who is Jesus? There was false teaching going around that said Jesus was not God, but he was a lesser God. That he was some sort of angel that obtained secret knowledge of faith that enabled him to discover a higher spiritual plane of living. And salvation wasn't through faith in Jesus, but through Jesus one could obtain this secret knowledge too, to earn a godlike status for themselves. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote this book. Ravi Zacharias said, outside of the cross of Jesus Christ, there is no hope in this world. That cross and resurrection at the core of the gospel is the only hope for humanity. Wherever you go, ask God for wisdom on how to get that gospel in, even in the toughest situations of life. Charles Stanley said, there is only one secure foundation, a genuine, deep relationship with Jesus Christ, which will carry you through any and all turmoil. No matter what storms are raging all around, you'll stand firm if you stand on his love. And Jesus said of himself in John 14, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In John 14, 11, he said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Friends, I believe we've lost the meaning of who Jesus is in the world. And so we can never lose that meaning here in the church. If we lose the meaning of Jesus here, then it'll be lost to the world forever. Our country, like we've been talking about, is divided. We're divided racially, politically, sexually, culturally, because we've reduced Jesus. We've made him lesser, and then we turn away from him. And when we do that, then other things that we believe become lesser too. The foundation of marriage, life, truth, those meanings, they all become subjected to the world's definitions. But Jesus 
is the truth. He is the one. He unifies. He holds all these things together. This Jesus, this person, this God, he is the one that walks these beaches. He is the one who calls out to these disciples and says, follow me. To follow Jesus is to live in such a way that your life is forever changed, forever impacted. Your life will never be the same. John the Baptist began his ministry saying, repent, right? Repent, turn, turn from your old way of life and follow and live a new life. And what do we see here in Matthew's story? The moment Jesus calls them, these first disciples, the Bible says they immediately follow him. I wanna skip ahead in the story a little bit. I wanna show you the account of how Jesus calls our author. Look at how Jesus calls Matthew. In Matthew 9, 9, it says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Now, you'd think that with a book called Matthew, written by Matthew, then we'd know a lot about Matthew, but we don't. We know his Jewish name was Levi. He was the son of Alphaeus. That name means joining. We know that from what was written about him, that he was humble, that he was self-effacing. He kept to the background a lot. In fact, all of this book that he writes, he only writes his own name down twice. The famous thing we know about him is he was a tax collector, which is perhaps the worst type of person Jesus could have called to be a disciple. Tax collector is kind of a nice term. It, it sounds like he's hardworking, maybe he's a blue collar guy, but in truth, he was more like an extortionist. He'd sit in a Roman-operated facility, probably with a Roman guard out front, and he was the guy behind the window who kept a record of what you owed the state, how long you had left to pay it off. And if you couldn't pay it off, he would tell you what the government would take from you to pay it off. Notice in verse 9 it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. We see the same thing from Matthew as we do the fishermen. And by now, Jesus' other disciples, they're walking with him. Matthew was chosen later. Can you imagine the looks on the other disciples' faces? Jesus purposefully calls someone to their group who is vastly different from all the rest. He's probably even a person who they don't like. When I was a kid in elementary school, I remember our teachers used to do the absolute worst thing ever. They would have us pick teams Two kids got to be team captains, and the rest of us would line up against a wall with our backs to it. And one by one, these two captains would choose who would be on their team. And I was deemed hopelessly unathletic by a jury of my peers when I was six years old before I ever had the chance to learn how to kick or dribble or catch because I was the smallest boy in my class. I was always chosen last. And the result of such rejection was that I never tried out for a sports team. I never learned how to do anything but grimly endure exercise. And as hurtful as it can be to be continually chosen last because it reveals what other people think of you, and the worst part is your entire class gets to watch it happen. Matthew is the sort of person who would have been chosen last. He, he's the type of friend who wants to hang out with you, but you make up an excuse so that you can avoid him. And if you see Matthew coming your way, you'd roll your eyes and mutter, oh, not this guy. But let's go back to why these men are so quick to follow. Why does the Bible say immediately? Like these men were mindless. That's what it sounds like, right? Like they're robots. They just drop whatever they're doing with no discussion, right? Well, historically, a rabbi in the first century would only choose a very select few, only the promising young men. They would sift those out from all of the others who had asked to be a disciple. And the rabbi selected only those who he felt would measure up. He had a standard. He wanted his disciples to become like him. A rabbi is not going to invest in anyone who doesn't have potential. So part of their selection process, a rabbi would examine and test and grill their disciples. 
And, and the applicant would have to show their extensive knowledge of the Old Testament. But what the rabbi was looking for was not some sort of regurgitated memorization. No, the rabbi wanted to know if the, if the disciple had the ability to discern and to ask good questions, to process information. Remember, the issue then for a Jew in the first century, it wasn't always so much what God said. They all knew what it said. They had memorized it. They had been taught it since they were children. The issue was, what does it mean? How do we live this way? Uh, a rabbi's disciple had to know how to interpret. So the rabbi was most interested in choosing disciples who exhibited intelligence and commitment and persistence, who demonstrated that they could be an interpreter of God's word, just like him. But Jesus doesn't grill his disciples. In fact, by any outward appearance, none of his disciples probably have what it takes to be a rabbi. In fact, more than likely, since they already had employment, that meant that they had all finished Torah school and they had all been rejected at one time or another by a rabbi. These men were already deemed unteachable. And now a new rabbi, a man named Jesus, this man whom John the Baptist said that he wasn't worthy to tie his sandals, a man whom John called the Lamb of God, Jesus is now assembling his own group of followers and he stops at your tax collector booth, he stops at your boat, and he offers you this invitation to follow. Follow me, he says. Be like me. What an opportunity. Anyone stuck in a dead-end job would have lapped at the chance. B.D. Ackley wrote a hymn, I would be like Jesus. And the lyrics are, Earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. This is an exciting invitation that Matthew receives this day. He's given a second chance at life. He's picked first. And from that day on, he would learn what it meant to follow Jesus. And today in 2022, it's no different. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's a great verse. Simple, to the point. I like it. Being a Christian is being a follower, a Christ follower. Andrew and Peter followed. Matthew followed. You and I, we follow. So the question for us is, am I? Am I following Christ? Jesus said once, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. And when we read that, I think there's a part of us that reads not the word like. We see like, but we, we skip it. We read exactly like, right? We read that and we think, well, Jesus was perfect, so I need to be perfect. I bet that a Sunday school teacher even told you once that even though you can never be perfect, you should still try. Even though you'll never be sinless, you should still try. Meaning that I try all the while knowing that I'll never be like Christ, but I ignore all that data and I continue to try anyway? That sounds terrible. What an awful way to live. That, that certainly doesn't sound like good news, does it? I mean, really, that, that's not good news. So I'm telling you, if your current hope is to try to imitate Christ, you're never gonna get there. Jesus was the greatest human being who ever lived. He was God in flesh. And we say that our lives should be spent trying to imitate him, to mimic him, to copy him. That sounds like so much work. It sounds tiring. It sounds defeating. It sounds impossible. How can I be like the Son of God? Christianity feels like that sometimes, doesn't it? With all the rules, I can't do it. I can't. Remember it all. I've sat in a thousand church services. I've sung tens of thousands of hymns. I don't know if I'm any closer to being like Christ than when I started. Sometimes, no, 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 <laughs> scratch that. Most of the time, I still feel just as sinful and broken and insufficient 
and incomplete as I ever was. Isn't the gospel supposed to be good news? I read that someplace. A life of frustration and not measuring up does not sound like good news to me. Instead, my life is just this endless prayer of me telling God, I'm sorry, I'll do better tomorrow. I know, I'm so stupid. I, I can't believe I just did that. That happened to me. Happened this week. What about you? Did you mess up this week? <laughs> do you ever get so frustrated thinking, that you're not like Jesus, even though you're trying to follow. So the problem must be that you're not trying hard enough. You're not doing enough. But that's not good news either. You do it. You try harder. Did Jesus say you can do it if you just apply yourself? Did Jesus say you can figure it out? Did Jesus say you can be anything you want to be? No. He said follow me. Follow me. Jesus wanted followers, not imitators. And because Jesus is our rabbi, then he's our teacher. He leads by example. In fact, listen to what Jesus says, even about himself. In John 5, 19, he says, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. And a little further down in verse 30, he says, I can do nothing on my own. Then you skip uh, ahead even more, John 8, 28. So Jesus says, what you have lifted up, the son of man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the father taught me. What do we see? We see that even though he was God, right? The example that he gives us is also one who follows. Jesus follows the father. That's because Jesus knows we can't be perfect. He knows we can't be like God. We can't be perfect. So once again, Jesus leads as one of us. He would never ask you to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. And so Jesus gives us an example of dependence. Not independence. Just let that sink in. Jesus gave us an example of dependence, not independence. In other words, Jesus doesn't give you a model of, you can do it on your own if you just try hard enough. You can imitate God if you just try hard enough. No, he gave us an example of total dependence on God. So here's the crux. The disciples left everything and followed Jesus. They left their nets, they left their boat, they left their jobs, they left their, left their tax collector booths, they left security and the known for the unknown. They didn't know where they were going, but they knew who they were going with. They left it all behind to follow Jesus because he extended to them an invitation, a new way of living. Follow me means Leave your old life behind. I have a new life for you. I have a better life for you. How many of you would quit your job for a million dollars? Most of us, without question. This is why the disciples drop everything and walk away. The opportunity to be with Jesus was life-changing, and it was just as life-changing as winning the lottery. So what's the key? What's the key to following Christ? Paul writes in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, I think being Christ-like can happen. Truly following Christ can happen. But first, I have to recognize that it is Christ in me. When I became a Christian, I died to myself. And now, it's not about me or what I can do. Now it's about Christ living in me, and we're doing this together. Jesus wants to share his resurrected life with me. He wants to live through me. So, so the gospel is not the imitation of Christ. Rather, it's the implantation of Christ in us. 
I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that has purpose and that has meaning, that has value, that makes a difference. I want to be a part of something bigger and better than myself. So I don't want to live a life apart from Christ or a life that's just a a, a nice life and you put a, a Jesus finish over the top of it. I want Christ in me. In Philippians 4, Paul famously tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Most of us love this verse, memorize this verse, quote it, but notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say one day when I become like Jesus, then I will be able to do some pretty cool stuff. No, Paul understands that Christ indwells in him. Jesus empowers us, and the good news is Jesus lives in us, so it's never about me measuring up. It's never about me being good enough. Andrew and Peter were fishermen, because a long time back, when they were young, some other rabbi said that they weren't good enough. They fell into the family trade with their dad, because there was nothing else. And then along came Jesus. Jesus said in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus says he's come to bring you life and not just a life that exists, not a life of toil and desperation and then we continually spend that time casting our nets, mending our nets, casting our nets, mending our nets. He says, I want to give you a life to the full. Why did these disciples drop everything and follow? They're not, they're not robots. They're not brainwashed. They weren't crazy. No, Jesus had something that they desperately wanted. Jesus wants to be in your life. He wants to give you life so that your life can be full. A life of trying to imitate him, that's, that's futile. It'll be your own effort. And just like every other pursuit, it's always going to be just out of reach. Jesus doesn't want you to have a try and fail story. He doesn't offer you a just do these five things and you'll be saved or just try harder or just work more gospel because we're never going to make it. We know that. We're, we are weak. We're, our, our willpower is not strong enough. Rather, Jesus wants to offer you a life of following, not just a life that looks good on the outside, but a life that's restored all the way through. So here's nine practical ways we can follow Christ in every, life, in every day of all of our life. These are, these are all straight from Jesus himself. The next couple chapters in Matthew are the Sermon on the Mount. And I thought, you know, we've, we've already done some lessons on Sermon on the Mount before. Rather than recap that in, and for the next three chapters, let's just condense it right now. Here's the Sermon on the Mount in nine points. These are all nine points that will help us follow Jesus. Number one, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Matthew 6, in Jesus' famous prayer, he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. How does Jesus teach us to pray? The same way he teaches us to live. It's his kingdom, so his will be done. Not mine. The bottom line is we can only follow one thing well. And if we're following, that means we are not leading. Number two, be humble. This naturally follows the first point, right? We're not leading, so we're not number one. The world says you're number one. I know, but you're not. And if we're seeking to follow Jesus, even he was humble. We don't have to worry about the credit that's owed to us or whether we exalt ourselves or not. When we humble ourselves and we practice meekness in our interactions with others, God will lift us up. Number three, don't judge others. Matthew 7, 7 says, judge not and you will not be judged. If I'm following, then I know it's not about me, right? And I recognize that. And if I recognize that, then I also recognize that I'm no better than anyone else. Jesus didn't even condemn the woman that was brought to him that was caught in adultery. In fact, the only person or the only people that Jesus ever judges are the religious leaders. 
And that was because they weren't humble. And they weren't followers. We can practice following Jesus every day by refusing to cast judgment on others. In fact, Jesus even goes further than that, and he says, love your enemies. That's number four. Love your enemies. Matthew 5, 44 says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not everyone is going to like you. But how many times do we ever wish evil on our enemies? One way to follow Jesus is by praying for those who despise us, showing the love of Jesus to those who hate you. Treat them with kindness, even if you never get it back in return. Love your enemies and love your neighbor. That's number five. Love your neighbor. Matthew twenty-two thirty-eight says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was always willing and ready to teach his disciples to love. As Christians, we are asked to love not only the people who live next door to us, but to love and to show compassion to everyone that we interact with. A part of being a disciple of Jesus is showing his love to everyone we meet. Number six, follow the golden rule. You can't remember every rule and command in the Bible anyway. So Jesus gives us a cheat. <laughs> Matthew 7 says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, the summary of all of Scripture, how you want to be treated, that's how you should treat others. How you want others to talk about you, that's how you should talk. Who others? Any others? Enemy? Neighbor? Jesus says, extend that same kindness and that same courtesy to all. But what if other people don't treat me the same way back? Don't worry. Number seven is don't worry. Matthew 6, 34 says, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Should followers worry? No. Not my circus, not my monkeys. Right? God promises to never leave us or forsake us. Worry is a sin. Worrying is the opposite of trusting God. Your job is only to follow and show Jesus in everything you do. Show Jesus in everything you do. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He is the king. He is the king. We are the citizens. We are the citizens that live in this kingdom. And so, in our day-to-day, -day, in what we do, we follow. We follow, we let his light shine. We know that we are actively following Jesus when others can see his light. And they become drawn to him as well. And we just spend our days seeking God first. Matthew 6, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. As we live, as we move, as we make decisions, we should be daily seeking his direction, seeking his counsel. We mess up our lives when we grab the steering wheel. He's already given us a book that tells us exactly what to do. And as followers, we should seek God's will in all of our decision making. We must consider the will of God in our lives and then look to him as best we can. We have the same invitation. Those 12 disciples, they were invited into a relationship. Not a program, not a set of rules, not religion, a relationship. Listen, I, I don't want to be in a church that focuses on rules and following rules. I don't want to be in a church that follows any one person's teaching or any one book or any one tradition more than Jesus. Let's, let's never put any one person's teachings above Jesus. Okay? Yes, we follow the Bible. Yes, we love the Bible. It's God's word. But the Bible is a story. And that story shows us that we have come to partner with, move with, advance with, obey, follow Jesus. It's not enough to just believe the right things and to obey the right rules. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Sadducee. Jesus said my righteousness had to exceed even theirs. Jesus asked his first disciples to follow him. That's what I want to do. And listen, being an unbeliever, that doesn't disqualify someone from following Jesus. If you're here today and you're still not convinced, that's okay. A lot of people who listen to Jesus teach 
they weren't convinced either. In fact, one of Jesus' own disciples was later nicknamed Doubting Thomas, most famously because he struggled with belief. But Jesus didn't kick Thomas out of the club when he doubted, and he didn't punish him. Rather, Jesus used that as an opportunity to strengthen their relationship. And he did what any father would do. He took Thomas by the hand and he drew him closer. All a Christian is, is simply a person who tries to follow Jesus every day, throughout the day. Teach, preach, heal, teach, preach, forgive, love God, love people, love God, love people. Because when a Christian patterns themselves after Jesus, great and glorious things can happen. Have you answered the call to follow? Have you left your old life behind to follow him? Are you allowing him to transform him into his likeness? Are you telling your story to others who need to hear it? Are you telling other people the good news about Jesus? And are you prepared to follow your shepherd all the way? Let's pray together. Thank you, God, that you call us into a relationship, not rules, because we could never make it otherwise. You are such a loving God to send your son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. Help us to orient our life to your son. We give full control to your Holy Spirit. Allow him to be our chief aim. We want to follow him with every breath we have. Help us to be Jesus followers to those we meet through the way that we preach, the way we teach, the way we heal, and the way we love. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for spending your morning with us. I hope that uh, you know that we're here. We're here in the sanctuary uh, every Sunday. We have two services, one at 9.30. That's our traditional service, and we have a choir, and we sing hymns. And then we have an 11 o'clock service, which is a little bit more contemporary. We have a worship team. During that hour, we also have a full children's program. We also have a youth group. And we have a youth group that meets every single Wednesday right here in Walden. We're only two minutes away. You can send your son or daughter over on their skateboard or their bike. This is a program for sixth grade through high school. Uh, it starts at six o'clock. We'll even feed them dinner and send them home to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.